Well, we're live streaming now. So you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Sarah Rigg. I'm going to be leading the workshop. Um, I do have an outline of a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be going through, but what I don't have on there is I just like to give a little bit of background about who I am and why you should listen to me. As it says in the workshop description, I've been a, um, a journalist, if you count editing my high school uh, newspaper more than, well more than 20 years, even if you don't, it's well more than 15, um, in various capacities as a reporter, copy editor, layout and design, um, editor of an entire weekly newspaper. So um, primarily my experience is with print and website news, um, but I think I'm going to take my phone off. <laughs> Um, so that's primarily what I'll be talking about. I'm not going to be as helpful in terms of, you know, helping you find uh, where to get publicized on TV and, and radio, but I will mention it in passing. Um, you're focusing on, are you focusing on local, yeah. local media? Yeah, local what, media. Working our drive. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Ann Arbor, greater Ann Arbor area, but I will also, you know, if you have questions, I think a lot of this stuff would be applicable even if you weren't in the Washington area about how to localize something, how to write a good press release, how to get, you know, the attention of somebody when you want a story. So, you probably know that uh, reporters and journalists are taught to kind of go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how of a story and incorporate that into the, the lead paragraph of the story. So I thought that would be a good way to organize the things that you should think about when you're trying to get publicity um, or to get a story published. Um, why don't we go around the room and tell me, uh, to give your names, just want to give your first name, that's fine, and tell us something about what your title is or what your role is and what you want to get out of the workshop and that will help me focus it. So. Okay, I'm Kathy Seidler and um, I'm uh, the community um, communications chair for Washington County Farm Bureau. Okay. So you would like you yeah. know, help by getting publicity for your events and uh, things I would think. I also manage our uh, Facebook page. Okay. Write press releases and I'm generally the, what you would call the media liaison between okay. our organization and the press. Okay. okay. I'm Mark Tucker and I'm an independent media producer List of the local media and contact points. Okay. Uh, my name is Don Rowell. I'm a marketing consultant and I work with a lot of several companies. Mm -hmm. And so this was interesting to me just to see see or hear your pitch on, you know, trying to connect with local media that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, try to push a story to and get it out to a lot of the local media groups or whatever. They, you know, they don't see the value, they don't know the time, or Okay, great. Hi, I'm Stormy Lloyd. I'm the marketing and relations manager at Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I also do Big Brothers Consulting on the side. Okay, great. <coughs> I'm here because I'm a mooch. <laughs> um, my name is Chris Wechner. I'm with the Ultimate Animals. You haven't heard of that? It's the household name is Coca Cola. It's my own business. So I give myself the title of Director of Marketing. So. I'm not the owner. I'm, not, I'm only the owner if you're going to give me money. Okay, gotcha. Um, but the reason I came down here, I figured I wouldn't have the benefit of extreme local contacts. This, uh, but I actually, ironically, just this morning, contacted Michigan Citizen to post a press release on the benefit of doing it um, early next week, so a week from Thursday. And I basically, on myself chattering on the phone, not knowing what the heck. How, I, I'm an expert doing online press releases. <laughs> I don't, there's, it's possible that not a single person in this room or anybody you know is better at that than me, but I'm an idiot with offline ones, and that's, what, that's really what makes people respond. So I don't know what I'm going to learn from you. If I walk away with even one thing, terrific. If I walk away with 100 things, even better. If 
and my expectations, you, you've already met them, you're going to trip over meeting my expectation about trying to say that. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to mention that there was a similar workshop earlier this year, but it was from the viewpoint of somebody who's on your end who's trying to get the publicity. And so what I feel I have to offer that's fresh and new is something from the viewpoint of the person who's going to be reading your press releases, getting your pitches, telling you what works, what doesn't work, why your stuff doesn't get published and why it does. So, you know, feel free to stop me. I think I'm probably going to answer 90% of your questions in the presentation, but feel free if something doesn't make sense, you don't understand, if I'm using some kind of specialized jargon jar you don't understand or something, you know, feel free to ask. But I will, I don't intend to lecture for an hour, or this is a two hour segment. I am intending to talk and chat um, for 35 or 40 minutes, and then I'll leave 15, 20 minutes at the end for you guys to ask additional questions. So, all right. First, let's talk about who. Um, this gentleman said that he wanted to know what the options were. So let's talk about those. Obviously, we're here sponsored by the Heritage newspaper chains, part of the Journal Register Company. They have weekly regional papers all over Spain, Milan, Manchester, Belleville, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor. Um, no, another big one, obviously, is AnnArbor.com here locally. Also, the Ann Arbor Observer. Monthly, there's the Ann Arbor Chronicle, online only, but you know, updating daily. So those are some of your major sort of straight, mainstream-ish news uh, outlets around here. But don't forget specialty magazines, papers, websites. For instance, uh, arts and entertainment type, like Current Magazine, I Spy. Other specialties would be like ethnic ones. There's Latino, Jewish newspapers around. There's business, specific business journals. Some of them have gone out of business, but I know there's a county-wide one. Come on, go ahead, come on in. Uh, new Age journals, there's like Awakenings and a bunch of those around here. Anytime you go to a coffee shop, just kind of look around and see what's what's scattered around, what people are picking up and reading, because that's going to be giving you an idea of other outlets. Uh, you might think that you want to get your story in the biggest outlet, but if you, like for instance, it's a new age event, like an event with an author, a new age author, maybe you really want to go to the Crazy Wisdom Journal, or maybe you want to go to Awakenings. Uh, if uh, we're, you, know, you were bringing in a speaker to talk about um, the Middle East, maybe you would want to go with a Washington Jewish community news, you know. Sometimes it's better not to try to spread out to a broad audience, but to target very narrowly. So you want to think about that when you think about who you want to pitch to. Like I said, I'm mainly going to be talking about print and website news, but you have other options. Uh, radio, locally I know um, Lucy Ann Lance does the Business Insider. So that might be one possibility. I really can't tell you a lot about getting into television. I'm sorry, I just don't have those contacts. But I think some of this stuff would apply in terms of knowing their, some of the other stuff I'm gonna talk about, like knowing their deadlines, finding an insider that you can talk to, an insider contact, and so on. A lot of that would apply to TV and radio as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, social media might be, like for younger audiences, be better, the better way to go, because they're not reading print newspapers. So if you have, you know, you already have your own Facebook page or a Twitter campaign, that might be the better option for you as well. And I won't talk about that in any detail either because there are people who specialize in marketing via social media and that is not my area of expertise. I think I'm fairly well versed on how to use social media for marketing, but it is not my area of expertise. But consider that there are other options and depending on what your story is and who your, your target, target audience is, Know, consider what your options are and don't just go for you know the big few obvious ones. So narrowing it down even further, once you've targeted the organization that you want to talk to, who within the organization should you send the press release or the email or who should you call? I know some people that think they want to go straight to the publisher. That's a bad idea. The publisher uh, doesn't care about content for the most part. They're the money person or the business person. A lot of people in the general public don't understand that. You probably don't even want to go to the managing editor. 
Uh, it's possible, it depends, it varies from, from uh, organization to organization. Your best bet generally at a large news organization is to target somebody in the middle, a regional or a section editor. That's generally your best bet. There can be exceptions to the rule, especially if you already have a personal contact, maybe you have a man on the street reporter, or you have somebody even higher up, even somebody in ad, ad sales even sometimes would be an advocate for you. So if you have an insider person and they're not that middle manager, that's fine, use them. But if you don't know who to talk to in your first try, somebody at that mid-level section editor, city editor, something at that level is usually your best bet. Any suggestions how to some efficient to find that person? Most, most organizations will have even in the print, in the masthead, they will list that or on the website. I have not find yet, found yet a news organization that did not list something about the organization or who covers what. Sometimes it can be hard to find because there's turnover mm -hmm. and maybe they're not there anymore, but generally speaking. And if you're not sure, did you have something you want to add, Michelle? I just want, I have a question from the online audience as soon as you're done. Yes, sure. Okay. So, you know, and they, you know, just it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, like to call up the general information number or send out an email and say, who, who's the regional editor? for this area or whatever. Thank you. Okay, question from Bob Cummings. He wants to know, do you know a good resource for finding magazines in Michigan by category? That's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't. I know um, a lot of the stuff that's local. Like I said, I just, if you go to any coffee shop and kind of see what's laying around, you get an idea of what the local monthly publications are, arts and culture magazines and stuff like that. But I don't offhand. I mean, I would probably just Google it. I really don't know. Um, there might be some kind of magazine publishers organization. You could possibly find something through their website as well. And so then my final, final point here was work your pre-existing contacts. If you've had somebody who's written a story for you before, on your organization before, they're a good contact point. They might not want to write about you again, or they might say, you know, my editor says we've written about you too recently and we're not going to do it, but they might be able to give you some other ideas of who you can speak to. And if they haven't published something on you recently, you know, work, work with who you already know. Uh, you know, it's always good to have an insider that you can talk to, build a personal relationship. That's true for a lot of these things I'm going to tell you about is, you know, just trying not to be generic and like I'm pitching far and wide to everybody I come across, but trying to build those personal relationships. So before we move on to, I think it's what is next, do you have any further questions about the who? You can always come back to some pops up later. So. Well, I, I, I have a little more question, but okay. it's, it's more about, when you say who there, it would be interesting to put on there, you know, kind of the organizational chart with a publication. So in other words, you have publisher, and you have the editorial, but on the other side you have, you know, kind of the ad sales or whatever. And, and my experience has been, you know, if you advertise, you know, your likelihood of becoming more in tune with the editorial people are better. Now you talk to the publisher, or whatever they said, you know, there's a straight line down the middle. And such. My argument is marketing and advertising is one side, editorial on the other side. The two never talk. Now I'll tell you for. From experience, that's you know not true. You know? So, but it would be interesting when you say who to map out, especially for people that are just getting into the industry or whatever, understanding who the players are and the dividing line between the two and how you may work one side or the other or both. That's tricky because a lot of organizations are organized differently. There are, you know, like you said, there's editorial and they're advertising, so that's two sides, and then they generally kind of go from the publisher on down through the head of advertising down to individual ad reps, and then it goes from publisher to managing editor, to editor in chief to subsection editors to copy editors to reporters. So there is that sort of that chain of command, but sometimes the titles are a little bit different, or they have, you know, some one this is under here, or we don't have section editors, we have city editors, or vice versa. So it's only helpful up to a certain point since each organization is going to be organized slightly differently. One thing you can look at is uh, mastheads generally. The masthead is, what, is the box that shows the staff and a print publication almost always are hierarchical from top to bottom. Top people get listed first. You'll see that on page two. People who are kind of lower on the hierarchy get listed lower. I mean, that's not universal, but that's the general trend. So if you're looking for somebody in the middle, that, that is how you would figure that out. Are you, uh, do you have an example? Yeah, here's an example on page two. That's our masthead. 
and it lists um, editors, sports editor, managing editor, publisher, um, and then and advertising um, as well. Yeah. So if it's a print publication, definitely you want to check out the masthead to get an idea of who's where in the organization. That's helpful as well. I was going to add, there's also the Michigan Press Association puts out a directory of its members, and it has the uh, managing editor, the publisher, and the advertising director and circulation director uh, contact information. Okay, great. Thanks for having that. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to move on to what? Like I said, if you think of a question later that relates, relates back to this one, it's fine. You can always come back to it. So a little bit later, I'm going to talk about format. So um, there might be things that you want to do other than putting together a press release, but the what here is primarily aimed at your press release or your email, whatever your first contact is where you're compiling the information that you want them to know. So consider what content you should include and what to highlight. Um, there's a couple approaches. There's the throw every piece of information you've got at them approach. It's not all bad. Sometimes it's better to do a smaller pitch, maybe just an email with two or three sentences, checking to see what their interest level is before you barrage them with too much information. But make sure that whatever you do, don't bury the lead. You know, I've gotten press releases from organizations where there was some honor for a local person, but they started out with three or four paragraphs about the national organization and their mission, and they buried the lead about the local person in the third paragraph. So don't bury the important information. You can put it as the headline, put it as a subhead to the headline, or start off the very first paragraph with the main nugget of information that you want them to know. We're having an event. We're honoring somebody. Somebody in our organization um, just got honored or promoted. You know, whatever it is that you're trying to get across, you know, don't bury it halfway down the press release. Put it up as high in the press release as you can, or the email, subject line, first, first line, whatever. Consider including an elevator pitch or a mission statement. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what an elevator pitch is? Okay, an elevator pitch is basically, if you were in an elevator with somebody who was really powerful and it could advance your career or your business, and you had one or two minutes to tell them about your organization or your business, what would you say? And so if you don't have one, you should be thinking about one. Um, mission statements can be are longer, generally. I'm of two minds about including those in press releases. In general, if you're submitting a press release and you're hoping a paper will pick it up, print it verbatim, they're likely going to cut out the mission statement. On the other hand, as somebody who has worked as a reporter as well, I kind of like them just because if I need to give a summary at the top of the story about what the organization does, a lot of times those mission statements are very useful to me. Make sure that it's professional. I've gotten press releases from an organization where they had that same mission statement at the bottom and they had the same misspelling or typo in it, it over and over again, so somebody obviously was not checking it each time they sent it out. So this can backfire on you if you're not careful. So think about what you want to say to them. Uh, if you're just you know, trying to get see if there's any kind of interest or bite, you might want to keep it real short. Um, if you're doing kind of a more scattershot thing and you, you want to get all the information out there, you know, try to think about how you want to organize it, make sure it's organized, don't bury the most important part. Other than that, I would have to kind of talk case by case to talk about what you wanted to include. Obviously, I could give you some obvious things not to do. Like, I also have worked with several community calendars, and you would be surprised how often somebody sends something to me where they give me the title of the event, the main speaker, and the date, but they don't tell me the start time. Or they tell me the start time, but they don't tell me the date, or they don't list where it's happening, or they don't give me a link for where you can buy tickets. So, I mean, think about what, what would a person need to attend, bare minimum, if you're advertising an event for a calendar or, you know, for a news story. They, they need to know what it's about, how much it costs, where it's at, what day it is, what time it starts. Don't forget the obvious things. There's some other things that fall into content that technically could go on the what thing, but I've put them in other sections, so we will get to some more of that. Does anybody have any questions about content of your pitch before we move on? Actually, how does that compare to a bio? Like, I mean, 
Okay, well, here's an example. If I'm writing um, a profile of a business person who's just been promoted or just got some kind of award, typically a PR person will send me an article outlining what the news is. That's the other thing I should talk about that I didn't have on here. What the news thing is, what, what makes it news? And news means something that's happened recently, right? But then they'll also send along a bio that gives fuller background. So they might just say, CEO of ABC Corporation, formerly with XYZ Corporation, in the press release. But the bio goes into more detail about their background and where they came from. So I can pick and choose details from that to put into the story or to, to mesh with the press release. Does that make sense? Are you clear with you? So is the, is the elevator pitch make a call to action at the end? The elevator pitch is basically, what is your organization? What are they doing? Um, why should anybody care about it? It's more not so much about you or a person, but about an organization or a business. You still look puzzled. So it sounds like within the vernacular, the bio is about an individual, um, the elevator pitch is about the Elevator pitch is the same, it's similar to a mission statement that an organization might have. We are, you know, our mission is to provide complete customer satisfaction in the XYZ industry or whatever. Which our elevator pitch should hopefully be a little bit more exciting than that. It's basically boiling down what do you do and why should that person care about it in one to two minutes. That's an elevator pitch. So it sounds like I should have raised my hand earlier. I need to look at that in my head. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. What? The other thing that I said I wanted to talk about was what makes it news. And we'll talk about in the timing element when I get to when as well. But I sometimes get press releases and you wonder why this person sent it because it's now November or October and the event they're talking about somebody got promoted back in April. It's not news at this point. Why didn't you send something out right when it happened? Uh, news or organizations are in the business of printing news. So sometimes they'll do more feature-based stuff. Features are less time sensitive. Profiles, features, human interest stories are less time sensitive. But if you are intending it to be news, you either need to send it out when it happened, or you need to explain why what you're sending out is news. Something new has happened, something's changed, somebody's got promoted, there's an event coming up that refers back to something that happened earlier. You need to make sure that it's news. And if not, if you want a human interest story or more feature story, then you need to explain that as well in your pitch. Does that make sense? My question is, if it's, if it's an upcoming and you're wanting to promote it, but you don't get the word out. Mm -hmm. So you can send those too early. That's absolutely true. And, so and I was going to talk about that when we got to when. So if you could hold on to that question, make sure I don't forget it when we get there. I was going to ask a time frame for question. Also. Yeah, okay. So well, let's wait until we get to when, and then we'll talk okay. about that. Daily versus weekly, websites, you might think, well, websites and dailies, I should be able to get to them something 48 hours in advance and I'll be fine. But it really depends on the organization. They might um, be setting up their news content, you know, a week in advance, five days in advance. If you send it two days in advance, it's not going to get in unless it's really spectacular. You have a huge national name coming in to speak. Maybe they'll pick it up, but, you know, to be on the safe side earlier is generally better. Although, as you said, sometimes it can be too early. So, if you're talking about weeklies, and there are a lot of weeklies, the Heritage Papers are weeklies, uh, the AnnArbor.com's print edition comes out twice weekly, you need to think about, you would not believe how many times as somebody who was the editor of a weekly paper, it, it went to print on Thursday, and we had to have uh, it completely laid out and ready to go on Tuesday so that it could go to the printer on Wednesday and be printed. You would not believe how many times I would get pitches on when, you know, on Tuesday or Wednesday for something that would happen that Thursday. It's like, you know, too bad, so sad, and it's going to be dead, dead by next week. Or even for Tuesday, for something for the following Tuesday. Well, it's already too late uh, because it's not going to get in this Thursday, and by next Thursday, your event's over. So think about what the news cycle is. If you know that they go to print on a Thursday, if you're pitching something to them on Monday or Tuesday, it's probably too late. You want to get it to them at least a week in advance. If it's daily or twice weekly, you might be able to sh sh cut that time down. But think about the fact that 
the day that the paper comes out is not the day that the reporters were finishing the story. It probably wasn't even the day before because it had to go to the printer to be printed at least 48 hours in advance, if not more, that you're going to be able to slip in a story idea at the last minute. So if you're talking about a weekly cycle, you want to think 10 days to two weeks at least in advance when you're going to start sending your pitch out. Is there an efficient way of finding the deadlines for you? Like how much advance notice each publication has? You know, the um, advertising actually is not a bad barometer of that. If you have a contact in advertising and they say we need to have advertising in now, ideally, and this is our drop dead, that's often going to be really similar to when um, uh, editorial content is due, although typically if there's a special section or something, they might be preparing that weeks in advance. So um, other than that, I don't know that there's a reliable way of doing it other than having an inside contact or asking. Well, you mentioned that, I mean, it sounds like you, asked, you suggested ask the advertiser, but then you seem like you would probably potentially ask someone else. Sure. What I'm just saying is, uh, if you like, if you happen to already be an advertiser, like the gentleman who left had mentioned, and you know what their deadlines are, you can be assured that editorial is probably on a similar deadline or slightly earlier than, than um, ads. Although you know they want the revenue, so they'll shove them in the ad at the last minute a lot more likely than they're going to shove in the story at the last minute. <coughs> but you can also ask somebody on the editorial team, or I mean, you know. Um, a lot of times, even just you know the switchboard operator or the secretary or the office manager or whatever will often know, and if they don't, they can check and find out for you. When's the last minute to submit editorial content for a particular issue? That sounds perfectly efficient to me. Thank you. Okay, so giving media outlets advance notice of special events. I want to talk about events sort of as a separate category anyway, and talk about this even though it doesn't necessarily all fit into when. Um, if you might think, well, I really want a feature story done. If you know you can't get one, they know he seems interested. Almost all news outlets, if they have a specific calendar that they put out, will at least put a blurb in their calendar. So if nothing else, you probably can get a calendar mention from most media outlets. Uh, but know that they also have deadlines. I know for AnnArbor.com, they request that you give them two weeks notice for an event. So if it's happening today, you should turn it in two weeks ago. Um, I think, uh, you know, and then it's going to vary by a news outlet as well. Um, and you might think, well, it's just like four sentences in a community calendar, but there are people who love the community calendars. I know that I look at them. I like to look for cool events that are coming up, free events, events with big speaker names. So I always keep an eye on the area of community calendars, and I have to think that I'm not the only one that does that. So. Um, don't think of that as being, you know, a lesser or a secondary thing. Obviously, it's always nice to get a front page story, but if you can't, a calendar mention is is great publicity for an event. Do you have any suggest any? Can you give any loose guidelines when something runs in a cal community calendar events versus when a, a press release about an event, upcoming event, makes sense? Um, if it's I mean, definitely is something that repeats over and over weekly or monthly. That's going to be sort of more of a community calendar type item than something that's unique. Like it's, we only do once a year or it's only once. If you have a big name, you have somebody who's nationally well-known is coming in to speak to your group as part of the event, you, you might get an article out of that rather than a, you know, a calendar mention. So kind of think about how excited is the average person going to be about this? Is it something that's ongoing and kind of ordinary or is it something really extra special? So if we, can help, if we help the newspapers sell papers, try and do a press release. If we're just trying to boost the newspaper space and <laughs> these community events, that's what I think I heard. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have phrased it that way, but sure. <laughs> I'm not always going to work Okay. Thank you. So, to your original question, how soon should you send out? You can you know, shoot yourself in the foot by sending out something too early. Um, Months in advance probably too much unless, you know, former President Bill Clinton or, uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh are coming to town to speak. You know, that's big news. You can keep the publicity going for weeks and weeks or even months. Typically, maybe two to three weeks before your event is a good time to start sending out pitches. Um, think about if you want on the community calendar and are also hoping for an article, maybe send the community calendar thing out three weeks in advance, and then pitch the actual story a little bit closer to the actual event. But again, it's going to depend a lot on the event. It also depends 
do people need to pre-register? Do you need to be closing registration before, you know, days or weeks before the event? That's also going to factor into it because there's no use getting a feature story about an event where registration is already closed, for instance. Um, I don't have an exact number for you. It really depends on the outlet. It depends on if they're a weekly, a monthly, a daily. It really depends on how big your event is. Um, I would say for a really large, exciting event with you know nationally known speakers, maybe you know five or six weeks in advance. If it's something smaller, three weeks is probably adequate. But you know, just make sure that it's before your registration cutoff, and then it's by the deadline of the outlet that you're going with. I know that's kind of vague, but you really kind of have to no negotiate it depending on the, the nature of the event and the outlet that you're trying to get in, in touch with. Did you have more specific concerns with that? Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, I couldn't be more specific on I that. But it, you can't it's really kind of so yeah. Just it does very much so. But I totally agree with you that it is possible to send something out so early that it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. So I would just send so. it again, just to be safe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Close well, to the identify time. two main factors. One has to do with the interest level of the event, general interest level. The other has to do with the newspaper or whatever public publicity devices. Print cycle. Their deadline and print cycle, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think those are the two main things that you need to think about when you're just at the time. So you answered it perfectly. Okay. okay. All right, and if you have other questions about when we can come back, we'll talk about where. All right, so ask yourself, is this story of local, state, or national significance? And that will help you figure out who you want to target. Um, if you have something that is set in the Ann Arbor area, but it is so exciting or it has such a big name speaker that it would be a wider, wider interest, you might want to put something in with the Metro Times in Detroit or go further afield into, you know, the Brighton area or out into Jackson, Jackson Citizen Patriot. So kind of think about how, if it's very micro-local, it's just, you know, something for local Ann Arbor business people, obviously you're going to target more of the, the local Ann Arbor, Washtenaw outlets. Um, might even be of national significance. That I can't help you with this much. But uh, you do want to think about that. And then if you have a story, like with your company, I I've got an example because I just ran across this the other day. Um, VA Ann Arbor, the Veterans Administration Hospital and Health System, actually has, is affiliated with the clinic in Toledo, Ohio. So normally, Toledo news doesn't play very well in Ann Arbor. People really don't, really don't care what's happening in Toledo. But if you really wanted a paper to pick that up and run that in their business briefs or something, you could say, you know, you would want to point that out at the very top of the press release, you know, the Toledo Center, which is owned by VA Ann Arbor, to help clarify what the local connection is. And then, yeah, localized press releases when possible. I talked about the example earlier where they went on and on about the local um, organization and then they buried the local person halfway through the press release. So the way you localize, so maybe that's the way that the national organization sent it to you and that's what you have to work with. But unless they tell you you can't rewrite it, there's no reason that you can't rewrite it. And if you can't rewrite it, at least you can add a personal note in the email or change the title of the email or whatever is going out to reflect that you're localizing it. And if possible, you want to rewrite it to bring the local angle up right at the very top. Because editors are going to look at your email. If they don't see Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, some kind of watch out connection in the first couple of sentences, they're likely to just pitch it. They're not going to mess around and dig deep down in there to see what the local connection is. They're just going to assume it's junk mail. Um, I can tell you that one thing I like as a journalist is when somebody puts a special note, they might include the press release but they put a special note at the top, hi Sarah, I thought you would be interested in this because, and they explain to me why they think that it would be interesting. And sometimes they're completely wrong. They don't know what they're talking about, I'm not interested. A lot of times I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have dug that far into the story to figure that out. Um, I didn't realize that though this person is working there, they're being honored for the work they do with this organization in Detroit, they're actually from Ann Arbor, so that it helps. Um, that helps me, you know, pitch, or that helps me give the argument perhaps to my editor if I'm, uh, as a writer why we should include that in the local business. So think about ways that if you have a national or state story but you're trying to, to uh, pitch it to local media, figure out ways that you can localize it. Um, 
had something else I wanted to say about this, but I'm not thinking of it, so maybe I'll come back to it. Does anybody have any questions about the question of where? So why? Ask yourself why the reader should care. Um, that will often help you figure out what you want to lead with. You know, um, we're having a food drive. Well, why? Maybe some statistics about how many people or children are going hungry in Washtenaw County would be a good way to grab the reader's attention. So think about why people should care. What's interesting about it? Is there a big name? Does it have a huge impact? What is it about this event or promotion or you know development that people should care about. This also gets back to that question I was talking about, about is it news? If it's not news, why are you sending it to me? And if it's about something that happened a while ago, you better come up with some newsy angle, something that happened recent or some new, new recent development. So it's our job to trick you into thinking it's news. <laughs> And then consider what you hope will happen. Do you want a calendar entry? Do you want a feature article? Do you want to be have somebody interviewed on the Lucy and Lance Business Insider? Do you want somebody to write a profile of somebody in your organization? What is it that you're hoping will happen? Because if you're nebulous, well, we want publicity. Try to think about, narrow it down, what, you know, why should they care and what are you hoping will happen? And then we're going to move on to the how, which will answer some more practical questions like, what's your delivery method? You know, typically we're getting them on email. Hardly anybody is faxing or, e or uh, sending me uh, press releases by mail, but it does happen. I can tell you that some editors have strong preferences about whether you send them a Word document or a PDF whether you send it as attachment or you paste the text into the document. Personally, I'll tell you my personal preferences and then I'll tell you what I think other people care about. I hate PDF documents, I hate them with passion. Please send me a Word document. People love PDFs because they don't change, because they're static documents and nobody can mess with them. That makes it very difficult because often if I'm compiling a community calendar, I'm just going to be cutting and pasting from your press release into my community calendar. I don't want to have to retype the whole thing by hand. And if you do that, you will make me mad and you'll be less likely to get into my community calendar. I also prefer inline documents over attachments because people are really paranoid about getting viruses and such. such. There are magazines, like literary magazines, that will not accept a story sent as an attachment. You have to include it in the text of the email. That is not necessarily universally true for all editors, but I think some of my concerns are likely to be the same as other editors. My best advice would be, when in doubt, send in multiple ways. Why not send them an attached Word document and paste it into the text? Why not send them a PDF and also send them a Word version? The other problem with PDFs, I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute, I just don't want to lose my train of thought. One of the other problems with PDFs is how you save them. You can save them so that you can cut and paste out of them, but some people save them as if they're a picture, so it's completely static and you can't cut and paste out of it. And I will often have to write to people and say, can you please resend this in another format? It's, I'm asking you as an outsider trying to learn. What's, do you, are you more easily annoyed by if people send you too many forms of inline, PDF, MS doc? Or just, or not enough. Yeah, I, I'm not personally not a, annoyed if somebody sends me something as a PDF and as a Word document. Although you might want to explain to them in the body of the email, I'm attaching a Word and a PDF document, so they don't think that it's two different things. Like one thing's a bio, one one thing's a press release. It's the same thing. It's just in two different formats. And also, again, getting back to what I mentioned about those personal relationships. If you have a personal relationship with an editor or reporter, you can ask them, what format do you prefer these in? As an editor, I'd like to say, never send it through the mail or fax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then you just have to retype it, and right. it's a real pain in the butt. Email is way easier. Back in the day, we used to have someone dedicated to just typing the press releases, but now, with computers and technology, we just want to do a cut and paste. Yes. Um, I kind of know the answer to this with people that I work with, but could you say something about um, not embedding or embedding photos in articles. I'm assuming you would prefer to receive a photo separately. 
Yes. That is one of the rules, yeah, with the exception to the attachment where you're going to have to attach photos. You don't want to embed them in a Word document. That, to me, says amateur all over it. If I get a, do a Word document that has a photo <laughs> attached in it, it's not always a bad way to go. I mean, but, yeah, to me, that, that looks amateurish to me. Who's accurate? <laughs> Did that answer your question? I didn't really have a question, I just wanted to bring it up because yeah. I know that it's much more difficult for you to format if someone is embedding something. Yes, that is generally true. Yeah. And you also, when you're sending photos, I actually really didn't plan to talk about this at all, but since we're talking about it, um, you need to think about um, resolution, uh, print versus web. Web, you can obviously send fairly low resolution pictures, it can be 100 pixels wide, and they could probably use it, although bigger is not necessarily bad unless you're clogging up their server. Uh, big, if you wanted something in print, you're going to have to send it. It's going to be probably two or three megabytes big um, file if you want something high resolution, printed large, and print publication. Do you agree, Michelle? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that will determine how. But you can always send low resolution pictures and ask if there's an interest in high resolution pictures. Although I suspect Michelle would probably just prefer that you send the high res <laughs> ones the first time around. Yeah. Cause we end up manipulating all the photos for um, web anyway, so we're right, going to be yeah. reducing the size. So. Yeah, but if you know for a fact that you're just getting like an online community calendar mention, it, you probably just want to send a low res. It's unlikely that they're going to need a high res for that. Um, Bob uh, in our auto online audience asks, what's a good rule for minimum resolution for a pic in print? Oh, in print? Um... If you look in the properties box, and if you're not sure how to do that, you know, you can, if you see a picture online, you can right click on it and go to properties. It will tell you in there how many pixels it is wide. Five or six hundred pixels wide minimum is usually what I would say. What you need for print, smaller for online. But if even 500 is not bad for online because they can always shrink it, as Michelle says. So 500 pixels, you said? I would say five to 600, yeah. Okay. Minimum. We have reached the end of my presentation. Are there questions? I'll bring a whole bunch, but I'll let y'all talk ahead of you. <laughs> Let's, uh, what are, what are, say, the top couple things that you know annoy you as a journalist? That annoy me? Yeah, that, I want to avoid it. Not do okay. So as a reporter or as an editor, from a viewpoint? Um, I'm not educated. My education is math and statistics. I don't even know that I know enough to answer your question. Dr. All right. Well, I've right. touched on a lot of them already. Is people who don't understand the, the deadline cycle. Some, somebody who send something to me, and by the time it would get into print, it would be too late. I mean, look, I don't understand that. You think that if it was important to you that you would make sure you knew what the deadline cycle was. Um, I've and had... I was uh, going to say, make sure it's local. That's the main thing for us. Oh, yeah, um, that's a big one. Make sure it's local, and if it's not, why are you, why are you bothering me with it? Because, you know, I mean, that's, that's what the local newspapers do. They print local news. And if it's not local, find a way to localize it. And if you can't, you know, don't bother. Um, there is such a thing as contacting somebody too much. I had an incident where I interviewed a guy for a, uh, was basically a business profile of a business leader. And I talked to him for almost two hours, where I typically would talk to somebody for 45 minutes for one of these, because he just kept going on and on and on. And when I got home, he had sent me two emails saying, oh, I forgot to tell you this, and I forgot to do that. And I didn't answer the email, and he called and left two messages the same night to make sure that I got in the two emails that he sent me. So there is such a thing as annoying somebody. They're on deadline. They'll get back to you. If you think something went astray, it's okay to follow up once, but, you know, don't be a pest. It's just common sense. You wouldn't want somebody to do that to you. I'd say also... Um yeah, I get annoyed when, people, when public relations people call, and let's say they're from Detroit, Oakland County, Macomb County, not even local, and they want to know, did you receive my press release, and is it going to be published? And my answer is usually, well, I receive 300 emails a day, 
unless it was local and said it was local in the subject line, I didn't see it. And, and then I don't know if it'll appear because we have so many submissions um, that you're just going to have to check the paper. I can't, every time someone calls, I can't look to see where it's at and if it's going to get in this week or next week or the following week and I can't keep ta tabs on it. So Right, and Michelle shouldn't be expected to do because she's the managing editor. She's the wrong person at the wrong level <laughs> to approach for the most part anyway. So, yeah. Um, just non-unprofessional looking submissions um, PDFs that are saved as if they're static images rather than as manipulatable text files. Huge pet peeve. Um, other than that, I, I can't think of anything offhand. Those are a few of them. Well, essentially, be considerate. You yeah. Be considerate and also just sort of put yourself in the other person's shoes. You know, would you want to have to retype an entire press release? Would you want somebody calling you at home after 7 o'clock, bothering you about something they sent you, you know, and so on? There's a question back here. Um, yeah, I apologize because I was late, so you may have covered this, but I was wondering, specifically for Ann Arbor Dot Carbon Heritage, um, who, um, who you, who they prefer to contact, like the reporters or the editors for stories? Sure, yeah, we, that was actually one of the first things we talked about when we talked about the who was uh, trying to under make sure you understand the chain of command, and if you don't, try to get educated about what the chain of command is in a typical news organization. Like shooting for the publisher or the managing editor is probably too high. They're going to be too busy for you. But you don't necessarily want to um, shoot for the person maybe on the bottom. If you're looking for somebody on the middle, like a regional or sectional editor, is generally your best bet. But the other thing to consider is do you have a personal connection with somebody already established? And if so, you can go through them. Even if Maybe they're on the advertising side. They can hook you up with the person they think you need to talk to. So don't be afraid to work your personal connections. Yes. Yeah, I I do in my head. I have never sat down to compile one, but let's talk about our options. I talked about this at the beginning, but let's go through it again. No, that's okay. So obviously kind of the two big ones are Heritage Media, which is who is sponsoring this talk today, and Ann Arbor.com. They tend to be the biggies. But you also have the Ann Arbor Observer. There's Ann Arbor Chronicle. What is it? Ann Arbor Chronicle, that online only. Um, patch. Yeah, there's the Patch website. We didn't even mention them. They're a fairly newcomer, but yeah, they have some influence. Patch.com. Patch there's individuals like the Celine Patch. There's the Dexter Patch. Dexter Patch. Chelsea. Well. Every, if there's a city that might be made in the next couple of years, is Patch version. Yeah. And there's a new Chelsea update. Sure, yep. And the Celine Post is new a new Chelsea one. Chelsea update? It's, well, it's a new online news oh. for Chelsea. It's <coughs> called Chelsea Update. And then we also talked about specialty magazines, like arts and culture magazines, would be like Current, I Spy, New Age, would be like Crazy Wisdom Journal Books, Crazy Wisdom, they're a bookstore, a local new, uh, new Age bookstore, they put out a print publication three times a year. There's also Natural Awakenings, which is actually a national magazine, but each market is localized with local articles. And you'll find those at like health food stores, sometimes coffee shops and things like that. If you want to go a little further afield, if you have something that's of statewide interest, you can go to Metro Times in Detroit. And people even in Ann Arbor read the Metro Times. Are there special interest groups that are local to Ann Arbor area? I know some of the ones yeah, I was going to tell there's um, a, like specialty religious or ethnic papers. There's a Washington Community Jewish News. Uh, I can't remember the name of them, but there are a couple of local Hispanic newspapers or magazines as well. The legal news too, Washington County Legal News. Legal, legal news, news. Um, mm -hmm. there's a county-wide Washington, I don't remember the exact title, but the Washington Business News Insider or something or other, it's a monthly for Washington County. So yeah, don't, th don't forget about niche markets, so. Student publications. Student publications, mm -hmm. that's a good example. Yeah, getting an article on the EMU News or the, you know, the Washington Community College newspaper. We talked about early, very early on about 
shooting it out to a wide audience versus targeting a narrow audience, like if you know you have a prominent, well-known speaker in the Jewish community, maybe you'd want to target the Jewish community news because you would get more people who would be interested than just flinging it out to the general public. Or the New Age Journal, if you have somebody who's like an astrologist or something that's coming into town and do a talk or, you know, give readings, you want to target the New Age ones. If you have something of broader interest, obviously you're going to go with the more mainstream media outlets. So I, I, yeah, I've reeled off the top of my head most of the ones that I can think of in terms of general news and um, more specialized news outlets. Um, you could also probably just do a Google search on um, media conglomerates or corporations in Michigan and then figure out if they have local, uh, you know, local editions because there are several of, of that variety in this area. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. I think you started covering this one, but I was frankly taking notes, so I was taking an in that section. <laughs> An email subject line. Do you suggest we put in the title of the actual document? If they have, should, we, should we customize the title to try and lure you to read it because of what you said, if you get 3,000 and a half? Yeah, emails? absolutely. I mean, yeah. So treat it like a Twitter account. Yeah, if you can summarize it in 60 characters, 50 or 60 characters or less, you know, give something about the, whatever your main point is, and also why it's local, I would, at minimum, those two things, your subject line, yeah. And then, as I mentioned, you can also just add the personal line, and maybe you're adding that personal line to everybody that you send it to, but they don't necessarily know that. Um, make it feel like it's personal, that you're, you know, hey, this is why I thought you would be interested in that's also something to consider that I didn't actually talk about, but I've talked about when I've given this presentation before, is newspapers loved to have a scoop. So you might not, you might think, well, I want to get this press release out to as many people as I can, and you've got, you know, 150 people, organizations, in your email subject line, and you're going to send it out to all of them. Think before you hit the send. Think, do I have a personal connection somewhere? Do I have a premium market or organization that I really want have this. If that's the case, contact them first. You know, so maybe you're two weeks out from the event. Say, I'm giving you the first look at this. I think you'd be interested in it. I would love to have something done in your paper. If you don't get back to me in four or five days, I'm going to send it out to a couple other outlets. So you might think that the scattershot approach is the best one, but if you can narrow it and target it to that one outlet that you really want or that one person you have a personal connection with, that's often a better strategy because they're going to be excited that they, get, that they got a scoop and that nobody else in the area has got the story that you've got. The other thing that you can do is you can send something out, scattershot, to everybody, hoping that they'll put it in their community calendar or they'll mention it in their business briefs or whatever, but then uh, uh, is somebody that you really, really want to take it and they tell you, well, I don't want that because you send it out to everybody saying, I've got a unique pitch for you. I'll introduce you to our speaker and you can profile them and nobody else is getting any opportunity to do that. So that's another way to approach that. Does that make sense? Yes. As, I apologize, I don't know if journalist, editor, you're on deadline. You're desperate to get news. Do you strictly look only for your email for news, or do you look at other outlets? Here's why I'm asking, so that may help shape the answer. As an online guy, I certainly put them all over the place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll focus on them, sometimes I use shotgun approach. But I'm trying to figure if I'm using duplication efforts by using using, a, using like an email wire service, PR web. Is that or the Associated Press, is that likely to reach you, or is email by far your most used resource? Well, I think that, you know, sending somebody a personal note on email and explaining to them why they'd be interested is certainly probably your top strategy, but I will tell you that I know tons and tons of uh, both mid-level managers and um, reporters on the street that look at PR Newswire and things of that sort to get ideas. So, you know, I'd say do both. And I'd, re I'd recommend Twitter myself. So. Really? Yeah, just tweet at him. Uh, oddly, so I've been experimenting with that lately, not necessarily successful because mm -hmm. I'm still learning, but 
I, I noticed I was getting ignored a lot, but, I, but that was just because I was doing shotgun approach. I was actually with targeting, not necessarily you specifically, but mm -hmm. people like you, yes. kind of start conversations. So what kind of, how would someone approach someone like you on Twitter to get your attention? Because if you're not following that person, you're not going to see No, you, you get, if you're, use the at sign, um, you're going to get it through email. I'll, I'll, Twitter will say so-and-so mentioned you, and then I'll go and look what, and, or if there, you know, there's a direct message as well, I'll get notification and I'll look and see. So the protocol mm -hmm. is fi find your Twitter handle mm -hmm. and send something to you via Twitter. Mm -hmm. That works as well. And all of our reporters are on Twitter now. So editors and reporters are on Twitter, and I think that's the way to do it. Or post on a Facebook page as well. I will tell you that I know a number of, of um, reporters that specialize in business reporting do keep uh, an eye on uh, PR Newswire and Business Newswire, though, for ideas as well. And it doesn't even have to be local in that case, because some, I mean, if you can localize it, that's great, but a lot of times they'll pick up a trend story and then localize it themselves. So. Okay, Bob had a question. It okay. was buried on here. I didn't see it at first. Um, let's see. Well, he says, note, if you're going to send an email to many people, email it to yourself and blind copy the list. This doesn't share email addresses among the group, and it looks more personal, as if sent to just them. Absolutely. And he also says, I, use that as well. I don't see how to get the properties of a picture on my Mac by right-clicking, so I'll Oh, I said stop in the media lab for help. So. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I was talking about Windows. I'm not sure about Mac. Okay. You know, it's possible if you could just go through the menu. If you pull in Mac, you pull it into whatever your editing software is, you would go through, um, you know, up to the menu, and, you know, search for file information. There's probably something that will tell you how many pixels wide it is. Okay. Then he, he also notes, if sharing information on Twitter, find an appropriate topic hashtag to better reach the desired audience. Like I said, I'm not the social media expert. I'm talking about local news, print, and media. Social media is definitely the way to go, but it's not the you know a way to go, but it's not the only place people are looking for the news. So. Well, we are almost at two o'clock, and my descriptor said this was going to be an hour, even though we had our slotted for an hour because I really didn't want to talk at you for an hour. <laughs> so I think I'm going to wrap it up unless there are any urgent last minute questions. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Everybody thank you, Shara. <laughs> thanks. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah.